Take your Bible and let's look at Psalm 23 again. We're going to be in here for about six or seven more weeks. And uh, like a 10 or 11 week study in just this Psalm. We've already looked at God is going to take care of all of our needs. Uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, I don't have to fear. So he takes care of the fear. He says at the very beginning of this thing, and by the way, that, it's the spirit of fear that is so pervasive right now. And uh, we, we just got to keep it in mind, you know, God's got us and he's got you. Uh, but, but he's told us, I, I want to refresh you. I want you to relax and uh, I'm going to give you rest. Today we're going to be looking at the fact that God wants to restore us. Um, and one of the things that we have to keep in mind is we're studying this book about or this chapter about the goodness of God. Um, the, the word is very clear when he says, um, I shall not want. In other words, if you look at the Hebrew text, you'll discover that it really says that he's all that we need and he's given us everything that we will ever need. He is all that we need. And so he gives us rest and he gives us relaxation and now he's going to come to us in uh, the last, this verse 3, and he's going to talk about restoring us. So let's just say it out loud for a minute, beginning in verse 1. Quote it with me, will you? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Now just finish up with this first phrase. He restores my soul. What's your soul? If you were to give me a definition of soul, what would it be? It is your mind, it is your will, and it is your emotions. It is how we think and make decisions, and um, it, it, it's like how you feel. Uh, all of those three wrapped up in one. When God got ready to make the tabernacle, he fashioned the tabernacle after the tripartite being that he had created in us. When he got ready to do the temple, he did the same thing. He made it in three different areas. So he fashioned it after man. And he says, uh, not only do I have all that you ever need, I am all that you ever need, I will bring relaxation to you. I will bring rest to you. I will refresh you, but I will restore you. Now, why do we need to be restored? Because the fact of the matter is, we get messed up. Our soul gets damaged. You know, your soul can be damaged. And when your soul gets damaged, it affects the way that you feel. You, you just feel out of sorts. When your soul is damaged, it affects the way you think. It affects the way that you make decisions. You just get all bent out of shape. And, and, and the Lord says, uh, not only can I meet every need of your life, I can come along and I can fix the way that you feel. I can fix the way that you think. I can fix the way that you make your decisions. My grandson passed away about four months ago from an overdose of fentanyl. Came to me one day and he said, Bob, uh, you know, uh, I don't have a hole in my heart. He said, I settled my relationship with Jesus a long time ago. Um, I'm not worried about whether or not I'm going to go to heaven when I die said, I know Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. But Papa, I just want to know why I do what I do. His soul was damaged. Uh, and, and God says to us, whatever you're going through with your mind and your will and your emotions, I can fix it. I can take care of it. God says, I want to to do that. Don't, don't you agree with me that sometimes we need to think straighter, sometimes that we need to feel better. And, and, and 
And it, it, don't you agree with me that sometimes willpower is just not enough? My dad uh, was a drunk for most of my life. Um, sometime while Kathy and I were uh, first married and I thought that I was on my way to Vietnam, um, my dad quit drinking. He was a chain smoker. He quit smoking. I went to him and I said, hey, dad, well, what, what, what's the deal here? What happened? He said, willpower, son, willpower. That's kind of the way that I was brought up. And here's what I found out. Sometimes willpower is not enough. And God says, I can restore you. Let me do for you what you cannot do for yourself. So I want to take a few minutes this morning and I want to talk to you about the reason that our soul gets damaged. I want to talk to you about the remedy for our damaged soul. And then just the last minute or two, I want to talk to you about your response to what God says uh, is the remedy. Let's look, first of all, at the reason uh, for our soul to be damaged. I, I, I just got, there are all kinds of reasons. I, I just got a couple of the top that I want to give you. And it's suppressed bitterness and sin buried. Uh, suppressed bitterness can damage the soul about as quick as anything uh, that I know about. How many of you in here this morning, somewhere along the way, somebody has been mean to you, has hurt you? How many of you have gone through hurt? I, you don't need to raise your hand, but the fact of the matter is everybody in this room at some time or another has been hurt by somebody else. Can I get a witness? Why is that? Because we're broken people and we live in a broken world and we are surrounded by other broken people and broken people hurt broken people, hurt people, hurt people. It's inevitable. You, you, you're going to get hurt. Why is that? Because you, you heard in a song earlier this morning, your will be done uh, on earth as it is in heaven. We're not in heaven now. We're in a very imperfect world. We're not in that perfect world of glory just yet. And imperfect people come along and they hurt other imperfect people. And only when we get into heaven will we not experience that kind of hurt. So since that is true, I'm not nearly as interested as to where your hurt came from or how often that you got hurt, but I am interested in your response to being hurt. How do you handle it? Um, you can do one or two or three things. Um, you can deal with it and get rid of it, or you can dwell on it. You can stew in the midst of it, and you can worry about what somebody has done to you. And as a matter of fact, you can even set a plan in motion as to how you're going to get even and how you're going to retaliate against those people that have done you so wrong. Now, here's the fact of the matter is, when somebody hurts you, it really puts you morally in a superior position over the person that has hurt you, but somewhere along the way you decide I'm going to get even to you. I, I, I'm, I'm going to fix you, buddy. And when you do that, you get down on the same level of the person that hurt you. But once you come to the place in your life that you're able to forgive that person for what they have done to you, you then become in a superior position over that person. But as long as you seek to try to get even, as long as you harbor the resentment, as long as you want to retaliate, you're going to be no better than they are, the person that came against you. Now, there's an interesting verse in Job in the fifth chapter when Job says, it's really foolish and sinless to harbor resentment. He goes on into the 18th chapter and he says this. He says, if you have bitterness and resentment in your heart towards somebody else, you're not hurting anybody but yourself. Amen goes right there. Now here's, here's the deal. It, this is an amazing thing. They hurt you and you can't get over it. You're struggling with the resentment and the harboring the bitterness and it begins to grow. They're out there having a blast. They're having a good time. 
And all the time that you're just miserable because of what they did to you, they're not suffering a bit. This is how I liken it. This is a great analogy. It's like taking poison into your body hoping it's going to kill them. Hello? But that's what bitterness and resentment does for you. That's what retaliation uh, will cost you. You say, well, what am I supposed to do with this? You're to let it go. Uh, you, you, you're like... Uh, I just did this at the Cove this past Sunday. I preached on the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. And and so these people catch her. uh, The the Pharisees bring her to Jesus and they say, look here, we we caught this woman in the very act. And the law says we are to stone her. But what do you say? And, and, And I love the way Jesus handled that whole story. He doodled in the dirt for a little while and raised up. And he says, okay, I agree with the law. So you that is without sin, you throw the first stone. Now, a lot of people are going around like I did for a number of years, and you got a pocket full of rocks, and you just can't wait to throw them. You just can't wait to hurl them. You just can't wait for that opportunity to get even with the person that so wronged you and hurt you. But let me just say something to you. According to what Jesus said, You and I are not qualified to throw a rock at anybody. No matter how they've hurt us. No matter how they've come against us. We're not qualified to judge and throw the rocks. Because of the sin of our own lives. Because of who we are. And and so he says you need to drop the rocks. And let me just encourage you here. Ladies and gentlemen, I've read the book. There's a reckoning day coming. And the judge of this universe is going to set things right. And he'll do a lot better job of it than you ever will. We'll bungle it. We'll botch it. But I'm going to tell you, God's going to set it right and it'll be righteous when he does it. All right, let me give you the second one. And not only is uh, will bitterness damage your soul buried sin will damage your soul what do you mean by buried sin we've talked a lot about people that have hurt you and that have done you wrong but how about how you've treated other people how about the sin of our own lives you you, you see there are a lot of people and maybe many of you and I'm discovering that a lot of God's people have. Matter of fact, last Sunday when I, I preached on um, the subject matter, there were an altar full of people that God had called into full-time ministry that had been going around through life carrying rocks in their pocket with a heavy load on them of the guilt of their own sin. It was an amazing thing. And I suspect that there are many of you that are trying to live life today burdened down, laden down, overcome by the weight of your own guilt and sin and having a struggle in this life. David likened it like this in Psalm 38. He says, for my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me. My wounds are foul and festering because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I'm bowed down greatly. I go mourning all day long. Well, the fact of the matter is we have good reason to walk around mourning and the heaviness on us because the Word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are none righteous. No, not one. I wonder how many of you got in a little tift with your family before you ever left the house this morning. Hmm? Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how unkind that we can be to the people that we love the most? Isn't it amazing to hear what comes out of our own mouth directed toward the people that love us the most? And we just spew this venom out and and it's out there before we even know it. And, and, and as soon as we hear ourselves saying it, we think, wow, 
What have I done? Husbands toward their wives, wives toward their husbands, and parents toward their children. That's why we need to be forgiven. Because we bury all kinds of problems and we bury all kinds of sin in our life. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 27 is an amazing verse and it's really eye-opening and you need to hear what it says. He says, the Lord gave us a mind and a conscience. We cannot hide from ourselves. You know, you can do a lot of things that you can hide from your spouse. You, you can hide a lot of things from your kids. You can hide a lot of things from your parents. You can hide a lot of things from your boss. You can hide a lot of things from your friends. There's two people you can't hide from. You can't hide from God. You can't hide from yourself. We get so burdened down with the guilt of our own sin, we just can't hardly put one foot in front of another. We think, well, you know what? If I can just uh, go on vacation and, and I can get renewed and refreshed, if I can just change geographics for a little bit, well, the problem with that, God's already waiting on you when you get there and you go with yourself. You, you, you can't escape those. You take your sin and your unforgiveness with you wherever you go. So what are you going to do with that sin? And what are you going to do with that guilt? Well, really, there's only one answer, and it's really to ask God to forgive you and come to the place that you're willing to accept that forgiveness from God and be able to translate that forgiveness over to yourself and be able to forgive yourself. But that's not the normal way that people deal with their sin and their guilt. Let me give you a few examples of what people do. First of all, people want to deny the reality of it. We want to deny its existence. And we just pretend like my dad for all those years. We had, we had a kind of a come to Jesus meeting with dad on two or three different occasions. And we wanted to talk about the issues of the past. And, and dad would just simply say, hmm. Oh, that's in the past. Just leave it there. Well, the problem with burying it and denying that it ever existed is that it resurfaces all of the time and it's going to come out somewhere. People deny, people minimize. They say, well, you know what? It's, it's not a big deal. It's just a tiny something there that, you know, I hardly even think about it. I hardly even remember it. Well, listen. If you remember it, it's a big deal. Then people go on and they want to rationalize their sin. And, and they try to convince in their minds that what their heart is telling them is wrong. Oh, that's, no, no, no. And then people try to compromise. Boy, here's a big deal that's going on in our culture. Here's a big deal that's going on in this country uh, today and we're watching it more and more and I, I saw something on the news this morning that absolutely staggered my imagination or may have been last night but, but, but it was mind boggling what we are accepting into our lives today and compromising and saying things like well that may have been wrong at one time but this is a different time in history now and it's not wrong for us today like it was wrong before. And so we compromise. We keep on doing it enough that we think that if we just do it enough times that it won't be sin. Uh, then we want to blame others. It's another way we deal with our sin and guilt. We feel like that if I could just blame somebody else for what's going on in my life, what it does is that it takes the attention off myself and it places it on somebody else. I'm watching this happen so many times in marriage after marriage after marriage. One of the people in the relationship will mess up and they will sin and they will do something horrible and, and, and the other person uh, has a real problem with what they've done and this person will come and say, will you please forgive me? I was so wrong. I, I, I promise before God he's forgiven me and I won't ever, with his help, I won't ever do it again. Forgive me. Well then, 
the offended that doesn't forgive because the offended knows that if I forgive that person, then I have taken away the reason for my blame. I can't blame them anymore. But as long as I don't forgive them, I can keep pointing it out to them. And it takes the focus of attention off of me and keeps it on them. So we blame uh, other people. By the way, how's that working out for you? And then, unfortunately, there are a lot of people that deal with it by beating themselves up. And they come to that place and say, you know what, that was so horrible for me to do. That was so bad for me to do. I, uh, and they're burdened under this guilt and shame of their own sin that they say, God couldn't possibly forgive me. Look how horrible this is. God couldn't possibly. What a horrible way to have to live by thinking that you don't deserve forgiveness. So how do you deal with it? Well, there's only one thing that works to deal with your sin. And that's to come to the place in your life that you realize what God says about your sin is right. And you agree with him about what he says about your sin. And say, you know what, God, you're right. It is sin. It is wickedness. It is iniquity. It is what you say that it is. So God, with your help, I, I want to turn away from that sin. And with your help, I want to live for you the rest of my life. Let me give you number two, if I could, is the remedy for the damaged soul. Now, the whole series that we're preaching here in Psalm 23 really is about the goodness of God. This week, uh, I had the opportunity on two different occasions to say to somebody in relationship to my own testimony, I, I would say, you know what, as horrible as things were, as difficult as it was, I don't regret anything that God ever allowed me to go through because I have discovered something that God has taken everything that he allowed me to go through to become who he has designed for me to become today. I shared it twice. They say, why do you feel that way? It's because of the way that God has used it to bring glory to himself. Let me give you a couple of ways that God restores your soul. First of all, um, listen to this. He restores our soul by making something good out of evil. I've always loved Romans 8, 28. It's always been a powerful verse, but it has never been more powerful, more meaningful to me than it is in the days that I'm in right now. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, it didn't say that everything is good. My goodness, I wouldn't even try to convince you of that because some of you are going through some things in your life right now that are not good. Horrible, nasty, ugly, wicked, vile stuff you're facing in your life right now. And the Bible does not say, God does not say everything is good. But what the Bible does say, he says, I will take that good and I will, I'll take that evil and I will blend it in with some other things and I will turn it around for your good. Now, hear me a minute. He didn't say he would do that for everybody. He said, I will do that for my family, for those that love me, to those that I have called to be a part of me. That's who I will do that for. And you come back and you say to me, Pastor, you mean to tell me that God would take even my sin, my wickedness, my past, and he'll use it somehow for my good? I'm a living, walking testimony to be able to say, yes, yes, yes. Now anybody can bring good out of good but only God can bring good out of evil. That makes no sense, though, until you go and read the next verse of verse 29. He says, I, I, I knew them and I have predestined them 
to be not for salvation or heaven or hell. I have predestined them to be conformed to the image of my son. That's the destiny. That, that, that's the power that, that you become looking like the image of Jesus. Well, what does that look like? Well, go to Galatians 5, 22, 23, and 24, and you look at those nine different characteristics that are in there when he talks about patience and goodness and gentleness and kindness and, and, and the nine attributes that are there and the peace that God, check it out. So when something is bad happening to you, instead of saying, God, why is this happening to me? The better question is, God, what character trait of Jesus are you trying to design and develop in me? Now, I already know that when my tag expires and I have to have a new registration card and I have to make an appointment with the DMV, I already know that God is trying to develop the characteristic of patience in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's a lot more interested in your character than he is your comfort. So maybe you need to be asking today, God, what, what about Jesus are you trying to instill in me today? Is this the reason I'm going through what I'm going through? Is this the reason I'm suffering like I'm suffering? What, what is it? Is it gentleness? Is it joy? Is it peace? Is it kindness? What, what is it that I need to learn? Um, the, the second thing I think that God uses to restore our, our souls is that Jesus paid our sin debt on the cross. 700 years before Jesus, God picked out a prophet by the name of Isaiah. And he poured into Isaiah some prophecy and some promises that were fulfilled 700 years later. Only God can do that. Only God could have possibly given Isaiah these words. Now I want you to listen to what Isaiah said. But he, Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for our transgressions. He, Jesus, was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, our soul is restored. We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. The Bible says, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all of us. Your sin, my sin. Don't mean to be mean or ugly, but that is the basic truth of Christianity. That is the basic tenet of our faith. That is the foundation by which you and I have our faith. And if what I read to you is not true, then why in the world are we here? It's a colossal waste of time. But God took his son and he laid your sin and my sin on him. And he paid that sin debt on Calvary. Every past, every present, every future sin of your life has already been paid for and the only thing that remains is if you have it is for you to receive it. That's what separates us from every other world religion that there is there is that the world's religion says do this, do that, do that but Jesus hung on that cross and cried it is finished. He didn't say I'm finished because he's still working on our behalf. He said, it is finished. What is it? It is the transaction between he and his father to pay your sin debt and to pay mine. And there's nothing left to be done. He 
except to receive him into your life. You say, well, preacher, you don't know what I've done. No, I don't. But I know this. What Jesus did on the cross is a lot bigger than anything that you've ever done. And I know this. His cross is a bigger deal than any bad that you've ever done. I said this yesterday at a homegoing service for a little precious 31-year-old girl and gave the invitation. You know, salvation's a big deal, guys. It's a big deal. It, it changes us. Changes you. Changes me. The Bible says old things pass away and everything becomes new. So, so I don't know where you were, don't know what you were doing. But if you weren't changed when you came to Jesus, I don't know what you got, but you didn't get Jesus. If you can still sin and know it and take pleasure in it and God not whip you for it, you have no reason to believe whatsoever that you're saved. If God comes to you, there is a change. Now let me, let me, let me help you with, with one other thing before I wind this down. Um, when, when Jesus forgives you, the Bible says he casts your sin as far as the east is from the west. And he puts it into the sea of his forgetfulness. Are y'all tracking with me? All right, you with me? If today you're feeling guilty for what you've already asked God to forgive you of and you receive that forgiveness, guess what? That guilt is not from God. He'll never make you feel guilty for that which he's already covered with the blood of his son. Let, let me close with this. What's going to be your response to God's remedy? Uh, the Bible tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that there are some of you that are right now under the sound of my voice that need to trust Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You've never been changed by the grace of God. You've never received God's forgiveness. Your life is still the same and you're still carrying that old heavy burden of the guilt of your own sin around with you, dragging it with you everywhere you go, every day. And God wants to set you free from that. He is a way maker. He is a chain breaker. And then there are some of you that are, that are here, you're like me for 30 five years of my life or so, I carried that old weight around of the bitterness and the resentment that I lived through all of my life until finally I just laid it down and I said, God, I can't deal with this anymore. And there are some of you that are, you're not hurting anybody but yourself. Somebody hurt you. Somebody said some bad things about you. Somebody did you wrong. You may have worked for this company for 25 years and gave them the best years of your life and they bring you a pink slip and let you go with no notice and no severance. Some of you gave the best years of your life to your mate and one day they came in and said, don't love you anymore, I got me somebody else and you're still carrying that bitterness and that resentment around with you. Some of you had a bad church relationship somewhere and you left that church angry and mad and resentful. You, you taught Sunday school, you served as a deacon, you ministered there faithfully for years, but something bad happened. You wound up over here. But every time you hear that church's name, you still get mad, you still get resentful and you've never let it go. 
I'm going to ask you just to come to this altar and just leave it here today. Just say, God, I can't deal with it anymore. It's not hurting anybody but me, and I'm going to let it go today. Would you stand with me and let's pray together. Father, I thank you for our time this morning. Thank you for what our hearts have experienced and our minds have been enlightened to. Thank you for the power and the strength and the validity of your word, Lord, that cuts and pierces and divides and draws people to you. May your Holy Spirit do what only he can do in this midst right now. I pray for those that need to be saved. Save them this morning. I, I pray for those souls that need to be restored Oh, Father, renew them today. If you're here today and don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you want to be saved, you want your sins forgiven, you want to know that when you die, you're going to go to heaven, I want you right where you're standing, right where you are, right today, I want you to pray something like this with me. I'm going to give you the words to say, but oh, friend, You've got to make it the sincere desire of your own heart. Would you pray something like this? Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died on a cross for my sin. I believe that he rose from the dead on that third day. My sin has separated me from you. Please forgive me of all my sin. With your help, I'll turn away from a life of sin. And with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Save me today. Now receive that forgiveness. God would never tell you a lie. And he said in his word that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's his promise to you. Receive that promise right now. God would never mislead you or lie to you. And if you meant that prayer today, every sin that you've ever committed, God has forgiven. And I welcome you to the family of God. If you prayed that prayer with me just then as I prayed it, you really meant it with all of your heart. I want you to lift your eyes. I want you to look right into my face right now and just say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer with you this morning.